Amen. Got it on the 301st take. Well done, Benny. Well, we're continuing today in our series focusing on Jesus' last words in his final days on earth. Last week, Jenny talked about um, Mark 11, and today we're going to be studying the first few verses in Mark 13. I'm just going to pray before we start. Lord, I, I thank you for the word that you've prepared for our hearts. Uh, I am just the vessel for you to speak through. And so, God, I just pray um, more of you, less of me. Whatever is not of you, I pray that it falls to the ground. And anything that you want to highlight, Lord God, I just pray that you use your spirit to guide me. And I pray for us, uh, for those of us listening, Lord God, give us ears to hear. Um, thank you for the way that you speak to us the way that you reveal yourself to us like a loving and gentle father. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. All right. Um, grateful if we could all stand for the reading of God's holy word. So this reading is from Mark 13, beginning in verse 1. As he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us, when will these things be? And what will be the sign that these things are about to be accomplished? And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will be led many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. They must take place. But the end is not yet. For nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of birth pains. May God help us to apply these words to our lives. You can be seated. And so if you weren't here last week, Jenny set the stage by unpacking Jesus' arrival into Jerusalem and the temple courts. It was a wonderful, challenging sermon. It's one that I'm still meditating on. Delayed obedience is still disobedience. Gosh, how many, how many of you did she get with that one? Um, if you don't know what I'm talking about, check out Liberty Church London's YouTube. It is, it's such a great sermon. And so, as Jen Jenny mentioned, the temple in Jerusalem, Herod's temple, was built on the same temple site that Zerubbabel began rebuilding on in 537 BC. Now, we explored this in some depth in our series, Unpacking the Book of Nehemiah. Check that one out as well. It's great. But this temple was destroyed by the Seleucid dynasty uh, in the middle of the second century BC. And so 200 years later comes King Herod. And Herod's from this mixed background. So his renovation of the temple ground was for two purposes. A, so that he could appease his Jewish subjects, and B, so that he could make a name for himself. The first century Jewish historian Josephus writes this in chapter 11 of Antiquities of the Jews. Herod undertook a very great work, that is to build himself the temple of God and make it larger in compass and to raise it to a most magnificent altitude as esteeming it to be the most glorious of all his actions, as it really was, to bring it to perfection and that this would be sufficient for an everlasting memorial to him. To him, Herod, not to God. Now, why was Herod building this temple? Whose glory was it for? And the interesting thing about this temple is that it was built on these massive quarried stones. And the average stone weighed between one to three tons. But the largest one that was found in Jerusalem, it, it was uh, 14 meters by four by four. And they guessed it weighed about over 660 tons. Now, for reference, the pyramids in Giza, the largest stone that they found there weighed only 80 tons. And if you've been on the internet for any period of time, you know that there are all these wackadoodles who will say, wow, you know, Giza must have been built by aliens because it's such an architectural marvel, right? And I'm, I'm just bring this up to just put into perspective how amazing Herod's temple was. Um, when you visit Jerusalem today, you can still see the remnants of the temple. And people will stand and they will stand in awe of these 
huge stones on their way to the Western Wall. However, when you visit today, you'll note that they've just been left lying on the ground where they've been unceremonially thrown off of the Temple Mount. Remember, this was the age before industrial machineries, and you can see these rocks are huge. Like, you can see the tiny people for scale. And we know now 2,000 years later that the temple has been destroyed, right? But in context, think about what's happening here. Jesus is... Sorry, guys, I'll try not to move. Jesus is making an amazingly bold prediction. Remember, the temple, which even though it was still under construction during Jesus' time, it was the pride and the joy of Jerusalem. In the very first verse in Mark 13, one of Jesus' disciples comments on how wonderful the stones and the buildings are. Before he even gets to how wonderful the buildings are, he's like, look at these stones. They are awesome. And here's a slide of the temple. You can see it sitting on the Temple Mound. This is a reconstruction, of course. The temple has now been destroyed. And as wonderful as these buildings are, the disciples says, well, look, look at how great these stones are. And what's Jesus' response? He turns around and he says, there will not be left a single stone that won't be thrown down. Now think about this prediction. Jesus isn't just predicting that the temple will be destroyed. He's predicting that every single stone will be thrown down. Okay, this prophecy is fulfilled about 40 years after Jesus' death in 70 AD. And this prophecy, it's so accurate and it's so unexpected that this is the primary reason that liberal biblical scholars refuse to date the book of Mark before 70 AD. The scholars, basically, they work backwards. You know, they assume a position of naturalism. And they think, well, miracles can't possibly ever happen. God doesn't exist. So there can't be such a thing as prophecy. And therefore, working backwards, they've already reached their conclusion. And they say, well, Mark has to be written, therefore, after 70 AD. However, there are plenty of excellent biblical scholars who aren't confined by their narrow worldview, and they're not forced to interpret the data in this way. And so scholars like John Wenham, F.F. F. Bruce, Dan Wallace, they all date Mark between 45 to 64 AD, years if not decades before the temple's destroyed. You know, beside the accuracy of Jesus' prophecy, this prophecy that not only will the temple be destroyed, but every single stone is going to be chucked off the temple mount, this prophecy would have been particularly confusing for his disciples here. Why? He's not only predicting a physical reality that will happen to this temple, but he's also foreshadowing his fulfillment of the sacrificial system. Again, you have to remember, for the Jews, in order to obtain forgiveness, they had to undertake the Levitical ceremonial sacrifices that would have been carried out at that temple. Again, Jenny did this excellent job of explaining last week how when Jesus entered this temple, he was just so angry at these money changers who were essentially abusing this system for profit. And so for the disciples and everyone there, the temple represented far more than just a beautiful building, far more than just these wonderful stones. It was the place where they could be made right with God. And so what on earth was Jesus saying? This place is going to be destroyed? How could this be? How could Jesus even dare to prophesy such a horrible thing? And we go back to the beginning of Mark's gospel in chapter 1. What do we see? We see John the Baptist in verse 4 proclaiming something unheard of at the time. He was proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. What's the question that comes up then? Where is the sacrifice? How can you have forgiveness and repentance of sins without a sacrifice? And we see this revealed in the parallel narrative in the Gospel of John. What does John say when he first sees Jesus? See in John 1.29, he says, Behold, so sorry. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. John calls Jesus the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. For us, this makes full sense 2,000 years later because we've already been given the spoilers, right? We know that Jesus became a voluntary sacrifice for our sin. The only sacrifice that could do this because he 
was the only one who didn't know sin. He knew no sin, and therefore death could not have any power over him. We have John foreshadowing the death, the burial, and the resurrection of Jesus at the very beginning of Mark. And John, echoing the lamb that would have been the required sacrifice at the Passover in the temple courts. Echoing God's provision for Abraham when he was willing to give up his one and only son. But for Jesus' followers and disciples, the idea that Jesus would become this ultimate sacrifice for the repentance and forgiveness of our sins, this was something so out there that they didn't fully grasp this idea until Jesus had died and had already completed his ministry. It was absolute craziness. But bringing back to John the Baptist, John also proclaimed that Jesus would be the one to baptize us with the Holy Spirit. You see this in John 1.33. John says, He on whom you see the Spirit descend and remain, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. Now remember, during this time, God's earthly dwelling place was in the Holy of Holies, the most beautiful, the most protected, the central place of Herod's temple. And Jesus didn't come to throw away the old system. No, he said in Matthew 5, 17, do not think that I've come to abolish the law or the prophets. I've not come to abolish them, but to fulfill them. And we see in Matthew 27, as Jesus dies, he cries out in a loud voice and the temple curtain that separates the Holy of Holies from man was supernaturally torn in two. Matthew 27, 50, 51. Jesus cried out with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit. And behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. From that point onwards, man and God would no longer be separated through, by a physical place. But through Christ's sacrifice, we would have access through Jesus to God. Wow. While the old system was just a mere facsimile of what was to come, Jesus would be its ultimate fulfillment. How amazing is it, church, that we no longer have to go to a physical place, but every single one of us, as a result of Jesus' ultimate sacrifice for us, we have the Holy Spirit. God dwells within us. Romans 8, 9, Paul writes this, You, however, are not in the flesh, but in the Spirit. In fact, the Spirit of God dwells within you. Hebrews 10, 19 to 20, the writer writes this, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is through his flesh. And I, I just absolutely love the book of Hebrews because it's this beautiful summary how Jesus you know, we find this perfect fulfillment of the old covenant in him, the new covenant in Jesus. And while I'd love to just read through Hebrews and, and, and kind of bask in the glory of this meta-narrative, I'm just going to read a little bit from Hebrews 9.11. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things that have come, then through the greater and more perfect tent, one not made with human hands, not of this creation, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood of goats and calves, not by these old sacrificial systems, but by the means of his own blood, thus securing an internal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of defiled persons with the ashes of a heifer sanctify for the purification of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without blemish to God, purify our conscience from dead works to serve the living God? Therefore, he, Jesus, is the new mediator of a new covenant so that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from transgressions committed under the first covenant. How beautiful is the gospel? How beautiful is the good news? And I know we've kind of jumped from place to place and you might be a little bit lost, but what I want to highlight is God's word, his divinely inspired word written to us is his love story from start to finish. And guys, if you're not familiar with this, if you're not familiar with the material, if we aren't reading, no, if we aren't studying the Bible on a regular basis, we're going to miss so much of the beauty that's contained in here, right? 
If, if I only kind of, if I ignored every single love letter that my wife ever wrote to me and just sort of spent time with her once a week, I would have no idea who she is. I'd be missing all these amazing gems. And so guys, read your Bible. Yes. Now, I don't want to get sidetracked on this next point, but I think it's in a very important place for us to touch on in brief. And as Jesus and his disciples, they're sitting on the Mount of Olives, which looks over the Temple Mount. He begins talking about a period known as the Great Tribulation, which foreshadows his second coming. Now, these verses, these are the ones that talk about the upcoming wars, the famines, the earthquakes. And the reason why I don't want to get bogged down on these verses is I think too many churches and too many uh, ministries, they get caught up in these verses, right? They get caught up in the nitty gritty of these passages and completely miss what Jesus wants to say to us here. Jesus specifically says in verse 7, do not be alarmed. You know, I've been alive long enough to have lived through several huge prophecies about the end of the world. You know, I think the largest one I lived through was in 1999 when 2000 was rolling around and everyone's saying, the world is going to, heck, you know, guys, start getting ready. And there's perhaps five people in this room who remember Y2K. Do you remember what that was? It was like this prophesied destruction of the entire world. There's going to be this global apocalypse where all the computers would shut down. There'll be trillions of dollars in uh, economic damage, and it never came to pass. And it's not just fringe uh, theological Christians that are making these predictions. You know, when I grew up in California, I remember we'd always be turned into this, um, tuned into this Christian radio station called uh, Family Radio. And it had this really widespread reach across the entire country. And one of the founders was this guy called Harold Camping, who by all means was a very normal guy. You know, he graduated from UC Berkeley with a civil engineering degree. He had a great job. He was theologically reformed. He loved the Bible. But he single-handedly more or less tanked his entire ministry and led tens of thousands of people astray when he predicted multiple times in the year 2011 that the world was going to end guess what? We're still here. And 2033 is coming, guys. And you just know that Christian leaders are again going to be predicting the second coming of Christ because it's exactly 2,000 years from the death of Jesus. But guess what? They're going to be three or six years late because most biblical scholars actually believe that Jesus was born between 3 to 6 B.C. And they get this from the date of Herod, etc. And so, yes, Jesus was actually born before Christ. It doesn't make any sense, right? Um, but there you go. A little tidbit for you. Now, what does Jesus say about this? Matthew 24, 36. He says, but concerning that day and hour, no one knows, not even the angels of heaven, not the Son, but the Father only. What is it saying? No one knows. But for the past 2,000 years, you get smart aleck after smart aleck coming along saying, no one knows, but I know. I've got the perfect calculation in hand. The world is going to end on such and such date. And I think the worst part isn't these crazy predictions, but Christians will read these verses and interpret them the very opposite of what Jesus is calling us to do. You know, Jesus is saying wars will come. Famines will come. Earthquakes will come. But these are not the signs of the ends. These are mere beginnings of birthing pains. I remember when Hannah, my wife, gave birth to Akadi. Like, the first time she had contractions within three minutes and there was blood and it was as gross, we were straight into Uber and we were at the hospital and they sent us home two hours later and they're like, come back. And Akadi was like, yo, I'm not coming out for another five days. And it was horrible. Horrible. It was the birthing pain after birthing pain, but guess what? It felt like in eternity. And in Romans 8.22, Paul says this, for we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. From creation, the world's been groaning in the births of childbearing. For the last 2,000 years, we've had earthquake, we've had famine, we've had wars that seem like they'd be the end of the world, the Great War, World War II, the Cold War, and they're going to just keep coming. As the news seems to get crazier, as social media blows up in your face, I want you to remember Jesus' words in verse 7. Do not be alarmed. And what I think is far more important is this. 
following that very verse where Jesus says, nobody knows the hour or the time, he gives a bunch of parables, and the parables are more or less the same. They paint a picture of two different people. One, people who are waiting and prepared for Jesus' second coming, and people who aren't. And in one parable, Jesus talks about a servant, and the servant's been given charge of the house by the master. The master goes away, and the servant thinks to himself, well, you know what? I think my master is going to be delayed in coming back home. So what does the servant do? The servant beats up all the other servants. He acts like the house is his own. He starts getting drunk, gets wasted, doesn't do what he's supposed to do. And then the master comes home at a time that the servant least expects, and it doesn't end well for him. You know, if I knew Jesus was coming back tomorrow, what would I do? I'll tell you, I know what I wouldn't do. I know what I would stop doing today. On top of that, if Jesus really coming back tomorrow, wouldn't we be so much braver? Wouldn't we be so much more courageous? Wouldn't we have so much more urgency in sharing the good news? My question to you, church, is forget all the prophecies, forget all the doomsday scenarios. Do you truly believe that Jesus could come back tomorrow? And if you do believe that, do your actions today reflect that belief? And I will be the first person in this room to repent and say, I'm afraid my actions don't. This is what I should be alarmed about. My last point, it hinges on Jesus' last words. Um, Part of Jesus' last words in verse 6. He says this, Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will be led many astray. I think for us to hear this now, it's pretty obvious, right? Obviously, people will come in Jesus' name 2,000 years later when we've seen how Christian movement has just exploded and grown. But in context, even though Jesus has a decent-sized following, he was just some dude from Nazareth, this poor Galilean peasant. And even his disciples haven't fully grasped the reality of who Jesus is. Right? We see after Jesus is arrested in the Garden of Gethsemane, they just start running. They all flee. And it isn't until Jesus' ministry is completed and they see the glory of his resurrection that, they, that it finally clicks. But Jesus isn't just saying many will come proclaiming that they're the Messiah. He's saying many will come in his name. You know, this was a bold, bold and extremely accurate prophecy seems like every few years there's another kook that will come around and say, hey, I am the second coming of Jesus. And in fact, there's a whole article on Wikipedia with a list of all these people. And I, 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 if you want to laugh, go check it out someday. But as a result, you've got all these Christian watch groups and uh, who are kind of like scoping, uh, pointing out these false messiahs. And they even hypothesize who's, who's going to be the next Antichrist. Right? And I, again... Um, while I've been alive, I've heard the Antichrist uh, be anywhere between uh, Bill Gates, Steve Jobs, Barack Obama, Donald Trump, the World Wide Web, even Monster Energy Drink, right? You have these entire groups of people trying to figure out all sorts of calculations, figure out who the false messiah is. But I'm going to show you a very short video. It's not the Monster Energy Drink video, but it's a good video. Utterly exhausted by the walk, the mother still has one final challenge before she can meet her chick. Finding him. There are over 3,000 fathers with chicks here, and even to penguins, they all look the same. For the chick, time is running out. But the penguins have a solution. The fathers get in line, and Dad and his chick join them. They form an identity parade. All she has to do is simply work her way along the line. Sounds simple enough, but among all the penguin lookalikes, 
Her partner is still tricky to recognize. So every so often, she stops and calls. Her cry is unique, and the father responds with a call of his own. It's what she was hoping to hear. After two months at sea, and a 60-mile trek across the ice, she's made it back in the nick of time. In a miracle of natural timing, he gets a morsel that will save his life. Now, I played that video for two reasons. A, it was super cute, but B, I think it's a, it's a beautiful illustration, right? In the context of emperor penguins, if the mother can't find the father, the baby will die. This is literally a matter of life and death. However, the mother penguin doesn't recognize the father by kind of hearing the sounds of all the other 3,000 plus penguins and then ruling them out by a process of elimination. No. She recognizes the father and the sound of his voice by the time that they've spent together that year, you know, in that courtship. And then upon her return, out of all the other penguins that they say even look the same to penguins, um, I don't know how they find that out, she's able to single out his voice among the crowd. And I saw, also found this other study that showed that the more time penguins spend together, the more they sound alike. This is a screenshot of the study. Um, I'll send it to you guys if you're interested. It's, it's kind of interesting. But I believe that this is true of us too. You know, if we want to recognize Jesus from all the fake Jesuses, we have to spend time with him. You know, if you ever speak to a bank teller about recognizing counterfeit notes, they'll tell you that they don't spend hours and hours studying fake notes. The second they touch a fake note, they know. And how do they know this? It's because they spend hours and hours of handling real notes, of touching real notes, of smelling real notes, of seeing how the light reflects off real notes, so that the second someone hands them a counterfeit, they instinctively know something's wrong. There's this wonderful uh, quote by one of my favorite preachers, Vadi Bakum, and he says this, if we don't know the Bible, if we don't know doctrine, if we don't know theology, it is virtually, virtually impossible for us to identify false prophets. So we need to do the same. You know, we need to study the gospel. We need to be in community. If you're not in a community group yet, guys, I recommend you to join one. How many made of Valerians do we have here? Yes. <laughs> You know, we've been studying the book of Mark together, and it's been amazing. We also need to pray. We need to listen to God. We need to spend time with him. We need to be devoted to Jesus. And just like the penguins, the more time we spend with God, the more time that we're stuck in his word, we're not only going to be able to recognize counterfeits, but we're going to sound and look and act more like Jesus. Now, when Jesus talked about people coming in his name, I think he was warning us far more than just people claiming to be the Messiah in his second coming. I think the far greater danger here is those who are spreading an entirely different gospel. In Matthew 7, 15, Jesus says, Beware of false prophets who come to you in sheep's clothing, but inwardly are ravenous wolves. You will recognize them by their fruits. And what is that fruit? Earlier in Matthew 3, John the Baptist, when calling out the Pharisees, he says, you brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bear fruit in keeping with repentance. As we discussed before, John's baptism was a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And he was challenging the Pharisees now, head on, calling them out on their hypocrisy. 
the gospel wasn't about the outward appearances. It wasn't about how finely pressed your clothes were or how many times you washed your hands or following this specific set of religious rules, but about a true transformation of our innermost being, a repentance of our sins and being born into new life in Christ Jesus and following in his footsteps. What gospel are you following and does it involve repentance? You know, I see so often, especially on social media, there are these really, really popular preachers with millions of followers, and they're the ones who will preach a gospel of love, a gospel of inclusion, a gospel of acceptance. And on the surface, this sounds really wonderful, right? God loves you just as you are. And there is an element of truth, right? Sorry. There's an element of truth to this. Jesus was criticized by the Pharisees for what? for hanging out with the tax collectors, with the prostitutes, with the sinners. But these sinners were the ones who left change, not Jesus. They didn't go away the same as they were when they arrived. God declares in Malachi 3.6, For I, the Lord, do not change. In John 3.3, Jesus says, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless one is born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 5.17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. It's gone. Behold, the new has come. And I want you to do a mental exercise. If you posted all of your beliefs online for the world to see, would they be absolutely accepted in their full on TikTok, on Instagram, on Twitter, on whatever social media platform you're on. Because if that's the case, you probably have the wrong gospel. Jesus wasn't crucified for what he did. He was crucified for what he said, and they hated him for it. If we are no different from what's culturally acceptable by society today, or what this particular political party believes, whether you're on this side or that side, then I think we truly have to question, who are we following? And does it result in the fruit of repentance? In 2 Timothy 4.3, Paul writes, For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching, but having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions. I'm not going to follow this guy. I'm going to follow the one that says what I want to hear and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. And I keep hearing the same thing over and over. The church has to evolve. It has to adapt. It is too old-fashioned. But to Jesus, the scripture was truth. God's word was truth. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. We see this particularly in the West, where the church appears to be dying. You know, that's not happening anywhere else. According to LifeWay Research, Christianity is growing faster in Africa than any other place in the world, and more Christians live in Africa than any other continent. And the church is growing in Asia as well. The church is thriving in places like China, like places like India, in Pakistan, even in Indonesia, where Christians are a minority, and Indonesia is the country with the largest amount of Muslims in the entire world. The church is thriving in these places. So what's wrong? But here in UK, for the first time in recent history, Christians are no longer the majority. And the church has been trying to parrot culture, trying to claim, we're the same as them. Come, it's easy for you to get in. And the data is so clear. The more the Western church attempts to appease the masses and look exactly like culture, the, least, the less attractive it becomes, right? Because you're just going to be a worse version of what they're already selling. How are you going to compete? And the data shows time and time again, it's all out there, that the only churches that continue to sustain long-term growth in the West are those that hold fast to traditional foundational values. We don't even have to look at data. Just look at what Jesus says. The church is meant to be countercultural, a moral compass, an anchor, a beacon for objective truth. They hated what Jesus was saying 2,000 years ago, and they hate what he's saying 2,000 years later. There's not been a period where they're like, yeah, this, you've, you've just met every single belief that we believe in. And, you know, even for me preparing this talk today, I've been second-guessing what I would say because, you know, I, I, as much as you might think I like it, I don't enjoy offending people on purpose. Maybe I do a little bit, but, you know, I, I, was, a, I was reminded 
of this proverb in Proverbs 29, 25, which says this, the fear of man lays a snare, but whoever trusts in the Lord is safe. And I know that isn't easy, but social media has more or less conditioned us into worshiping fear of man, right? We're commissioned to, we're, we've kind of been conditioned to post based on how many likes we're, we think we're going to get, how many retweets we're going to get, how many shares we're going to get, how many new followers we get as a result of this post or that post. I spoke to a, this wonderful friend of mine, and she said her worst fear, she's got this really popular Instagram, and it has this amazing following. She said, my worst fear, Anthony, is getting canceled. Not speaking falsehoods. Getting canceled. And don't think this is a new phenomenon. You know, for those who've heard me speak before, you'll know that my favorite person in the Bible, other than Jesus, is the Apostle Paul, because he is such a bonehead You know, he looks just like us, but Jesus decides to use him to build his church. I love him. He's flawed. He's broken. In Acts 5, we see the apostles, they're brought in by the Sanhedrin. So the Sanhedrin are the highest religious council in Jerusalem. And they bring them in for uh, for questioning. Remember, this is after they already played a direct part in Jesus' death and his crucifixion. And as they're brought in, they say to the apostles this, we gave you strict orders to stop preaching in this name. They don't want to even say his name. What are they talking about? The name of Jesus. We told you to stop. Why are you still doing it? What is Peter's response? Same Peter that ran away and denied Jesus three times. He says, we must obey God rather than men. And you see later on in the same chapter that upon hearing this, the Sanhedrin wanted to put them to death. That's how pissed off they were. They were ready to kill Peter and the other apostles. And in the face of death, Peter stands firm and says, I would rather and I need to obey God rather than men. However, this same Peter that looked death in the face and spat in it, later on in Galatians 2, what do we see? This same Peter was afraid to eat with Gentiles. Why? In verse 12, it says, he used to eat with Gentiles, But when some friends of James came to visit, he refused to eat with the Gentiles because he was afraid of criticism from the circumcision party. And these aren't even enemies. These are guys who are supposed to be playing on the same team, right? And he's afraid of what they might think. So he's like, oh, you know what? I'm not going to do what my heart, my conscience tells me is right, which is to eat with these people, God's people. I'm going to stop because I I don't want to be seen differently. I don't want my social status to be affected. You know, our self-image has been raised to almost idolatry status, where this is the most important thing to protect, not God's word. I'm going to close with this final verse. Matthew 16, 25. Whoever would save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it. Let's pray. I know there are potentially many of us in this room who are listening online with a hard heart who found this message very difficult to hear. And maybe you're just rejecting it in your heart right now. And and I know there's nothing I can say to change your mind. But if this is from God, if this is truth, I know that the same God that pulled me out of the pits of rebellion can change your heart. I know the same God that opened Paul's eyes and cured him of his spiritual blindness can change your heart. I know the same God that gave his life for you and me so that we could have life and life to its fullness can change your heart. The same God who is the way, the truth, and the life. The same God who is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. He can transform us. He can give us new life. And he's speaking to us not to condemn us, but because he wants better for you. He has so much greater plan for you. And and, and I know you have your dreams and your hopes, and they're important, but God is calling you to something greater. And as we're praying, I'm reminded of that story of the rich man. The rich man that Jesus said, you're almost there. 
you're almost there, but there's something, there's one thing in your heart that has held idolatry status and just, just, just let go of it. And in that case, that man's idol, idol was money. And Jesus told them to let it go. And the rich man was very sad. He was very sad because that was his precious. And I don't know what your precious treasure is, whether it's a relationship, whether it's money, whether it's status, whether it's a job, whether it's how you look among your friends, but God is calling you to something greater. And I think of Paul, he gave everything up, wealth, status, he was shipwrecked, he was beat, he was thrown in jail, he was rejected, he became poor, and he said, I will give this all up again. Everything I lost was trash compared to the glory of the riches that I have found in Christ Jesus and following him. Church, we are called to put the old self to death. And when we do, we are born in new life. We are made a new creation following in the steps of the only perfect man to have ever lived, Jesus Christ. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.